Hey guys, Artful Readers Club review day again. Uh, I'm just finishing my July book. Yeah, I know, I'm way behind. Um, my book was this one, A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki. Uh, and as usual, I read it in audiobook format. And it's actually read by the author herself, which I really love. I don't think you can beat having a book read to you by the person who wrote it. The book is set on an island in Canada. A Japanese-American author has um, kind of semi-retired there with her husband. And she finds a bag washed up on the beach. And inside the bag are various letters and journals and things like that. The main diary belongs to a young 16-year-old Japanese girl called Naoko Yasutani and it's a very difficult book to describe. <laughs> um, it covers so many things. It's kind of a coming-of-age novel. It's kind of a rediscovery of yourself in later life. It's a spanning of the generations and family history novel. It's, um, it's, it's just, I can't, I can't describe it. It's got bits of Zen Buddhism in it. It's got bits of philosophy and quantum mechanics in it. It's all very much based on, uh, chaos theory, fractals. You know, if a, a butterfly flaps its wings in Africa, it causes a hurricane in Basingstoke kind of stuff. Um, the characters, there's very few characters in it, but the characters are fascinating. There's Naoko's family uh, spanning back four generations. So there's herself, her father, her grandfather, and um, her great-grandmother. Her great-grandmother is a Buddhist nun of 104. And I'm telling you, if Yoda had a grandma, that's what Jiko would be. Jiko is y like Yoda's grandma. She's she's great. She has the most amazing <laughs> philosophies on life. Um, she she teaches Naoko to deal with her life, which is actually pretty horrible. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but she's bullied and she's picked on, and her family is useless and. Um, she's uprooted from the only life that she really knows in America and transplanted into this Japanese culture that, you know, although she's Japanese, she doesn't understand any of it. Uh, and she's kind of left to fend for herself. Um, and parts of her story are harrowing and heartbreaking. And I have to admit, I cried in a couple of places because it was just horrible what was happening to her. Um, but, you know, she learns how to cope with all of this and how to move on from it and how to transform from this young American kid to a grown American, uh, American Japanese woman living in Tokyo uh, through her great grandmother, this, <laughs> this amazing woman who comes out with stunning things like up, down, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you can just you can just picture this sixteen-year-old girl sitting there going, "What?" <laughs> um, but for a time, she goes to live with her grandmother um, over a summer holiday, and she, you know, through the the rituals, um, being cut off from the people that she knows who are not nice to her and being taken away from the stress of her family and her life in Tokyo and transplanted onto the top of this mountain with this Yoda-like grandma and her aide. Um, Practising Zen Buddhist rituals and learning chants and learning how to sit Zazen and, and things like that. Um, it, I, she's not exactly enlightened, but it certainly gives her enough space to be able to think um, and to kind of look at her life in a different way. Uh, she's still very much a 16 year old girl and at times I could slap her but at the same time uh, she doesn't understand a lot of what's happening um, and she can't understand and it's only through contact with her great-grandmother and then um, indirectly with contact with her grandfather 
who was a kamikaze pilot. Um, and the themes of <clears throat> sort of suicide and heroism and being a superhero um, and being uh, studying philosophy and things like that is something that is carried on through the generations. All four generations are into philosophy and um, they all have thoughts about um, suicide, either good or bad or indifferent or whatever. Um, it's quite a trip and it interspersed between this narrative, first person narrative of now or Nauko her name is but she calls herself now and she has this whole transcendental conversation with herself about am I now? What is now? Because now is now then which means I don't exist anymore but I do because I'm now of the future because I just happened and you know she she gets really into it and she's you don't have to understand quantum mechanics and Proust and all that kind of stuff to get where she's coming from because she's looking at it from the point of view of a 16 year old discovering the world um, but some of her conversations with herself are just they're just fascinating um, because she's both incredibly logical about it as a child would be but at the same time she's got this influence of this uh, Yoda like character in her life and her father who's extremely depressed uh, and who she kind of looks down on um, and this grandfather figure who she looks up to um, and they keep changing positions you know one minute she's looking up to them the next minute she's like I don't respect you for that um, her mother is there but not really there for her um, yeah it's, it's a, a fascinating story and in between this narrative you've got uh, the characters of Ruth and Oliver who Ruth is a retired writer by virtue of the fact that she hasn't really written anything in 10 years um, and they've moved to out of New York City to a little island in Vancouver because of Oliver's health Oliver is this fascinating guy <laughs> he's a complete nerd um, but he's nice and he's kind of there to explain the bits that you might not understand if that makes sense he's kind of this comical character um, but he's also the one who asks the right questions of Ruth Ruth gets very caught up in Naoko's story and uh, you know as anyone who has ever read a journal of somebody that they don't know and I've been in this position myself if you are that kind of person you tend to want to find out more about the person who wrote the diary uh, you want to know about their life you know one about you want to know about the stories behind the story um, and of course she goes searching for Naoko um, trying to find out you know where is she now what happened to her where's her father um, and so on and so on uh, and to a certain extent she's she finds what she's looking for but at the same time she doesn't uh, and Oliver's there to kind of point out that you know perhaps you're looking in the wrong place or you're trying too hard or well uh, I think you're over analyzing this you know <laughs> he is the witty one who's like well you know <laughs> uh, if you're searching for her on the internet and she keeps disappearing whenever you find anything then perhaps you need to stop looking on the internet <laughs> you know he's very practical um, and at the same time he's he's got this he's got this kind of air of the mad scientist about him uh, because he's into ancient um, fossils and um, trees and paleolithic seashells <laughs> you know all sorts of crazy stuff he is so embedded in, in prehistoric history um, and of course Ruth is dealing with the history of now which is um, yeah ironic actually uh, because now story takes place when she's 16 which is 10 years ago to Ruth um, so her now is the now of the past her now NOW as in right now is the now co now of the past yeah if you can deal with things like that then you'll love this book because it's just that's what it's like all the way through um, it does make your brain spin 
if you are into like I mean I'm in it covers for me everything I'm interested in it's Zen Buddhism it's journaling it's history it's um, writing it's uh, analyzing a story literature it's philosophy it's quantum mechanics I mean it's got everything in it that I enjoy talking about and, and listening to so for me it was really exciting to, for it to all come together there are some places where you think well hang on a minute it, that sounds like she's writing to somebody like she knows who she's writing to um, and that can be a little bit jarring at times but as you go on through the story you start to wonder if perhaps she does know who she's writing to uh, and I can't tell you any more than that because if I did I would have to give you one of the main spoilers of the book um, but Ruth has this weird relationship with Naoko um, where it's almost as if she can influence what she does uh, it's not about time travel it's more to do with um, Oliver explains it at the end where it's a bit like Schrodinger's cat um, where it's not a case of the cat in the box is either alive or it's dead it's a case of at a certain point in time it's both alive and dead and therefore according to um, I can't remember his name. Hewitt, I think, is his name, uh, who proposed this m mathematical theory that anywhere that there is a split of possibilities, the the time splits, and therefore there can be um, parallel worlds where Ruth finds the diary, or she doesn't find the diary, and Ruth, who finds the diary, either reads it or she doesn't, and so on. And you get this branching of possible timelines and at the same time you've got this kind of narrative coming back at you in reverse that's it, yeah it's a bit crazy it's a bit of a crazy ride but if you enjoy all that kind of stuff then you will absolutely love the book if you don't understand it or you don't you're not really into it or you're not it doesn't bother you then it's just a nice story I don't know what else to tell you about it. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a fascinating book. Um, looking at other reviews online, um, because I like to go and see what other people have thought, most people were exactly the same. They, they were like, oh, it's fascinating because Ruth is the observer. Um, in the Literally in the quantum, quantum mechanics sense, she is the observer, where by observing things, things change. Um, that's a whole philosophical quantum mechanical theory thing that you know you might want to go and read up on it if it interests you. Um, Oliver explains it all at the end, it's, he kind of summarises all the, the bits that you go huh? Um, but if you've read about that kind of stuff and it makes sense to you, this whole idea of infinite possibilities and stuff, then I think you'd love it. I really do. Um, and it's not even just a, although it's very much about the females, um, I think men would enjoy the book too. It's not very, uh, it's not a typical girly girly 16 year old happy story. It's in places quite traumatic. Uh, Ruth is a bit of a, I think she's the least likeable character actually. For me she's okay but she was the least likable character apart from Naoko's mother who just didn't really enter into the equation basically she was just off in her own little world virtually um, the men figures in her life are just not there for her when she needs them uh, or, or not tangibly there when she needs them and then when she finds out that they are there They've been there in a completely different way to than, than she expected and it changes her whole view on her entire family. So it's quite a ride. It really is. Um, I enjoyed the references to um, various Japanese cultures and things like that. Um, that will be where the jarring comes in of, yeah, but why would Naoko be explaining that unless she knew she was writing for a Westerner in 10 years' time? Um, but she does go into... 
little bits of the rituals and stuff and she translates some of the chants she talks about Japanese culture uh, and what it's like living in Tokyo versus the rich uh, rural areas and things like that and then underpinning all of this very human narrative you've got three world catastrophes um, that have uh, now co ex explains it as um, I can't remember the exact words she uses but she talks about 9-11 and she talks about it being something that was so catastrophic it ripped through time um, and then of course you've got her grandfather who was a kamikaze pilot in World War II of course World War II being having a huge impact on um, both Naoko's now present life 10 years ago and Ruth's present life because she is American Japanese so if it wasn't for World War II she would never have met Oliver she would never live where she does now she wouldn't be in Canada etc etc um, so all of that underpins both the stories and then of course you've got the fact that um, Naoko's diary is actually written before the tsunami and the fact that Jiko's temple where Naoko goes to live is actually in Senda I think it's called um, it's basically the area of Japan that got hit worst by the tsunami um, so for an awful lot of the book you're like Ruth thinking well you know what happened to her um, did she die in the tsunami did she survive did she was she at the temple is the temple still there um, was she in Tokyo when the earthquake hit did she die in the earthquake um, did was she perhaps not even in Tokyo at the time what happened where, where would she be um, you kind of find out where what happened to her and where she ended up but you don't find out where she is now if that makes sense which it probably doesn't but in the context of the book I think that that is right you know there is one of the criticisms of the book in the reviews that I read was oh it's got one of these newfangled ambiguous endings um, which you know the newfangled ambiguous ending is one of the things that really annoys me about various books that I've read lately however for this particular book it makes sense because there would be an ambiguous ending because it's all based on this whole um, the Zen Buddhist philosophy of rebirth and coming back and reincarnation and all that and you know transformation and achieving enlightenment and so on and the quantum mechanical theories of yes but everything splits at a point of choices or opposition or you know if there are two possibilities then there or there are three possibilities then there are two splits or three splits so you know did Naoko survive or did she die if she survived is she still in Japan or did she go somewhere else if she went somewhere else where did she go and so on and so on and so on so there's all these possibilities so the fact that the ending is ambiguous I think is fantastic uh, because it both resolves what happened to her and at the same time leaves you not knowing what happened to her not knowing where she is now which kind of is cyclical in her philosophy her own philosophy because she doesn't she starts off her diary telling you she doesn't know what now is and she's talking about both now as in the present moment and now as in my name is now and I don't know who I am so it, everything comes full circle uh, and it's it's quite a ride it's not hard going um, I wouldn't recommend it for young teenagers uh, if you're going to get young teenagers reading it I would get the abridged version because there's some quite nasty stuff in the unabridged version but it's nothing that is too horrendous for um, an older teenager I would think 16 plus would be fine with it um, because everything is implied it's not graphic uh, there's nothing particularly graphic but there are some sex scenes although again they're not 
there is sex happening, but the sex is not described, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, that's... Like I say, 16 plus would probably be okay with it, but younger than 16, I think it might be a bit... I don't think they'd understand it, to be honest, because some of the theories in it are quite... They, they rock your head, basically. I came away from it going, ah, uh, what? And thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to read that again. <laughs> um, and I've studied quantum mechanics and philosophy, so, yeah. Um, even if you understand all of those philosophies, you'll get it, but you won't necessarily have an answer at the end. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I don't think there is an answer, really. But, um... That's all I can tell you really. I liked it. I liked the, the characters, I liked the humour, the warmth of some of the characters like Oliver um, and Jiko is just fantastic. It's really heartwarming. And then you've got this vile contrast with the kids at her school who are nasty to her um, and her mother who is just very distant and not really a part of the family and um, Naoko who swings between she's a typical teenager you know she's at the mercy of her hormones and one minute she is a child and the next minute she is a almost a woman and one minute she is happy and young and she wants to go to Disneyland and the next minute she's you know having quantum philosophical conversations in her head about why why her dad wants to kill himself you know um, that is something to be aware of the concepts of um, suicide not so much depression but just suicide um, are a running thread through the book so if you are sensitive to those kind of issues then you might want to do a little bit more research before you read it but again it's not there's nothing graphic, it's all just, you know, there's this running history in her family of, you know, her her grandfather was a kamikaze pilot, her father's tried to commit suicide multiple times, and the book starts with Naoko telling you that she's decided to kill herself as well. Um, and, you know, Ruth's subsequent discovery of, you know, what reading right the way through the book at the same pace that Naoko is writing it to dis to live her life uh, as closely as she can and discover what happened to her. <laughs> it's, um, it's intense. It's not like reading. Uh, it's not the kind of book that you just take to the beach and flip through on a weekend. Um, it's hole up for a weekend when it's cold and raining and you've got lots of time to sit and think and go and research stuff um, and I if you're the kind of if you're kind of like me and you like to take on the role that Ruth has in the book which is reading the diary and then researching and finding out what happened and trying to understand what's going on then I strongly suggest you have a pen and paper with you when you're reading because I came out of it with about six pages of notes of things that I was like oh I love that quote or oh I need to I need to think about that myself or um, you know or just all sorts of things that I was like oh I want to read that book <laughs> you know um, the printed version Ruth Ozeki actually says this at the end of the audiobook that there are the nuances that she can bring to it reading it herself in the audiobook version however in the print version there are lots of um, footnotes and references and sketches and things like that that you can refer to that bring a whole other layer to what Ruth is discovering um, which obviously you know you can't describe a footnote <laughs> um, or you can't describe a drawing in, a, in an audiobook so um, I think it's definitely one of those books that you should read it in your preferred format first and then perhaps just go and read the other format afterwards and Ruth Ozaki herself actually suggests that. I think it's worth reading the version and also hearing it from the author and vice versa. Um, I think I will probably get the book out of the library and go and you know see if there's see what I've missed from 
not having the print version. Normally I, I draw as I'm listening to the book, but yesterday um, I started sketching this while I was um, reading the second half of the book. Uh, and she just came out like this. I, I have no idea why she came out looking like that, but she kind of does look like Naoko in my head. I mean, she doesn't look like the Naoko that's described in the novel, but the Naoko that was in my head when I was reading it, yeah, she very much does have that kind of Japanese schoolgirl look about her. So, yeah, I was quite pleased with that. I don't know what my book's going to be next month. Um, I was going to read Rivers of London. However, I started listening to the audiobook yesterday and within 10 minutes I was bored. Stupid! The guy's voice is dreadful. And he's one of those people who, instead of reading a book using the syntax that is in the actual book, he would pause in very strange places. Uh, you know, that sort of thing really annoys me. So, you know, like literally 10 minutes in, I returned it. And that's, I'm not listening to this rubbish. Um, so I'm going to try and find that book in written form to do another month. Uh, but I have plenty of other books on my phone here um, to listen to an audio. Um, I don't know which one I'm going to go with because I, I had, like I say, planned to read Rivers of London this month. Um, but that doesn't seem to be going to happen uh, because it's not available in my local library. I've got to order it from somewhere else. So, yeah, I don't know. Next month's review will be a surprise. Uh, there you go. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, if you read A Tale for Time Being or you've already read it, by all means comment below and tell me what you thought of it. Um, I think it's going to be the one of those books that people either love or hate uh, and they either get it or they don't um, but I think if you get it then you'll get a lot out of it and certainly for certainly for anyone who keeps a journal uh, I think um, Naoko's story on its own is uh, really interesting um, and the way she's written it is very interesting and the way she philosophizes about her journal writing and her own existence is just fascinating. So there you go. <laughs> That's uh, my July review and hopefully I will get my August review done before the end of September. Who knows? <laughs> See you later.